any case, um, the, uh, the, the, the relationship between the United States and China is in the newspapers every day, especially this morning uh, over the great cyber hacking uh, controversy. It's a relationship that is steeped in superlatives. The uh, number one largest economy versus the number two largest economy, the global hegemon versus the rising power, the most important uh, bilateral economic relationships. Um, we tend to get so caught up in the superlatives that I think we don't really dig into the weeds and, and, and try to uh, understand the subtleties that, uh, and the powerful granularity of the intersection uh, between these, these two nations, uh, these two uh, economies. I think we can do better, and, and that's why I, I wrote the book, and I'm, I'm not sure that uh, I have the definitive answer either, but I've made an effort to probe into the uh, intricacies of this relationship uh, from um, uh, an economic point of view, a social point of view, a historical point of view, uh, and uh, through an examination of the leadership styles, uh, approaches, uh, and the institutions that shape uh, this relationship. The, um, and what I'll do this morning is maybe talk for another 15, 20 minutes and then really make an effort to just entertain your questions or engage you uh, in discussion uh, and, and um, uh, take it from there. The sort of story began, uh, at least in the context of the way I studied this relationship and presented the book uh, back in 1978. 1978 was a pivotal year for both the United States uh, and uh, China. China had, of course, just come out of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, there was a, uh, a very uh, tumultuous post-Mao leadership transition. The economy was in a state of shambles, uh, and really its survival uh, uh, as, a, as a nation, you might argue, uh, hung by a thread. Halfway around the world, in our country, 1978, we were in the throes of the great stagflation. We had um, uh, horrible economic performance. Uh, our financial markets were in tatters. Uh, we had mounting serious uh, inflation uh, and uh, uh, increasingly stagnant uh, uh, economic growth. It was a stagflationary quagmire, uh, and we needed new answers, and we needed them uh, quickly. Both um, economies were, were very needy. Uh, and so they turned to each other initially, uh, at least from my amateurish um, psychological uh, uh, point of view, uh, uh, and consummated a marriage of convenience uh, where they um, uh, relied on one another uh, for new sources of economic growth uh, at a period of, of great uh, turmoil in, in both economic systems. The U.S. turned to China increasingly for cheap goods, for cheap capital, uh, and uh, ultimately uh, for Chinese buying of U.S. treasuries to fund our budget deficits. We became uh, uh, very uh, dependent on China to sustain uh, our um, uh, economic growth uh, coming out of the stagflationary uh, quagmire. China, desperate for a, um, uh, uh, a resurrection of its own economy post-Cultural Revolution, uh, on the heels of the new leader, Deng Xiaoping, uh, focused on reforms and opening up, adapted an export-led growth model. Uh, and uh, they, they built uh, an extraordinary uh, infrastructure uh, of uh, uh, production, uh, distribution, and export generating capacity, but they needed external demand, and they got that from us, the world's uh, ultimate consumer. They couldn't have done it without us. So the marriage of convenience uh, started to morph uh, into uh, what um, uh, ultimately ended up being a worrisome codependency. Uh, and codependency, uh, if you're a student of psychology, you'll know that codependency ultimately uh, is an unhealthy relationship where two individuals, or in this case two economies, rely too much on one another uh, for their own sense of self uh, and sustenance. Down the road, I mean, it all worked for a while, but down the, the road, as two individuals who get trapped in a codependent relationship 
uh, ultimately end up painfully finding out, uh, the codependency led to imbalances and frictions. And we're seeing some of those frictions, of course, play out uh, in real time right now. China became a very unbalanced uh, economy, relied too much uh, on exports, too much on uh, investment, too much on the natural resources that requ required to build uh, and fuel the manufacturing uh, uh, base. Uh, so much on natural resources that it, it developed horrific problems with environmental degradation, pollution, uh, mounting income inequality. There was nothing sustainable about the Chinese model uh, that uh, proved to be such a powerful antidote to its post-cultural revolution um, uh, fr fragility. <laughs> the U.S., for its part, also became increasingly unstable. We consumed to excess. We did it in a period uh, when our income growth was lagging, so we squandered our saving and we went seriously into debt uh, and we collateralized our excess spending uh, and our debt uh, based on bubbles, first equities, uh, then property, uh, and eventually uh, credit. And of course, it all ended uh, in, in, in tears. Unbalanced economic growth, whether it's China or the United States, is not a sustainable um, uh, recipe. And I argue that uh, as vigorously as I know how to do uh, in the book through a series of chapters focusing on how we got uh, from this uh, rather innocent marriage of convenience uh, to a, uh, an unstable, increasingly precarious state. The antidote to uh, uh, unbalanced economic growth is what we economists call rebalancing, uh, uh, owning up to your imbalances and changing the structure, changing the system that has led you down uh, this unbalanced uh, economic uh, growth path. Uh, it is the only answer. Uh, China seems to, to get it. Uh, and the, the corollary to that is that we don't. Uh, and that is a worrisome uh, uh, conclusion uh, of, of the book. But I'm not going to do what Jim Rickards did and sort of leave you uh, in a state of depression. I'm going to offer you a more uh, constructive alternative that I think we need to contemplate as concerned citizens uh, as well. But China gets it because seven years ago, the former premier of China, who I feature a lot uh, in the book, uh, Wen Jiabao uh, stood up uh, in March of 2007 uh, in front of the, uh, uh, the international press uh, after the annual um, meeting of the National People's Congress and said that while China looks fine on the surface, beneath the surface he was worried because the economy was increasingly unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and ultimately unsustainable. Uh, and this was a big deal in China. These became known as the four uns, unbalanced, unstable, uh, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. And it triggered an intense internal debate inside of China over uh, how to uh, address uh, these four uns. Uh, four years later, China actually enacted, because it frames its strategy, and strategy is a word that uh, it really is not in the, the U.S. political dictionary, as you know. But China does have a strategy, and they frame it around these Soviet-style uh, five-year plans. And they enacted the 12th five-year plan uh, in March of 2011, three years ago, that laid out a broad framework to rebalance, to move away from the export uh, and um, investment-led uh, structure to one that derives much more support from internal private consumption, the people. Uh, in the People's Republic of China, uh, ironically, had been on the outside looking in for most of this miraculous 32 years of economic development. But that was a, you know, a, a broad framework. Uh, it featured a lot of things that would ultimately uh, lead to a consumer-led uh, model, but it didn't have teeth. And so uh, new leadership uh, came into power in China uh, about 17 months ago. Uh, and they held a major meeting last uh, November 2013, now known as the uh, rather um, typical um, uh, Chinese nomenclature, uh, the third plenum uh, of the Central Committee of the 18th Party Congress. <laughs> but this third plenum meeting uh, enacted 60 articles of reform and over 320 specific detailed measures that really uh, 
uh, encapsulated a specific blueprint as to how to get from point A to point B, from the unbalanced to the balanced, from the producer model to the consumer model. Uh, and uh, what they also did is they ratified a new approach to governance, which is a huge issue in China, uh, taking power away from the last vestiges of the state planners uh, and uh, setting in motion uh, a, um, uh, a new system uh, that must ultimately come to grips with the single greatest impediment to the, the progress of China, power blocks and corruption. And a really unprecedented anti-corruption campaign has now been launched in China, uh, but uh, uh, it barely scratches the surface of a far more systemic uh, or insidious uh, problem. But I'm pretty confident, as, you know, as, if we look out over the next 10 to 15 years, that you will see uh, a very different China uh, uh, than, than you see today. The, t the title of my course I teach at Yale, a big lecture class on China, is called The Next China, and this very much frames the vision that I have. It's a consumer-led uh, China uh, that derives much less support from external demand, in part because the major uh, sources of that external demand are weak, but also because China uh, uh, needs to direct uh, its work uh, and its um, uh, consumption more toward uh, the internal rather than the external economy to address many of these imbalances uh, that I alluded to earlier. Uh, the U.S., what can I say about the U.S.? I mean, you know, they, the, um, um, you know, the Chinese did the 12th five-year plan. They did the third plenum. Uh, they're going after corruption. They've got a new for a style of governance they're trying to now implement. Last October, we shut down our government for 16 days. Um, we are obviously at a, a political uh, a stalemate here, but it's also a reflection of a system uh, that really outsources strategy to this wonderful uh, a Scottish man uh, who uh, 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 wrote powerfully uh, of the invisible hand in the late 18th century. Uh, and I say we need more than uh, the invisible hand of Adam Smith to have us address the strategic challenges that we now face uh, in the 21st century. So the um, two scenarios that I take out of this, uh, uh, this book, uh, one is a bad one and one is a good one. The bad one, I would say right now, the way things look, I would place greater odds on it. I would call it an asymmetrical rebalancing where China changes and we don't. We focus on trying to resurrect uh, a tired uh, and increasingly unsustainable excess consumption model based on debt, based on asset bubbles, fueled by a central bank that continues to inject money into our system to boost uh, asset markets, to make wealthy people wealthier, but something that does not address the plight of the beleaguered uh, American middle class. It's not a good model, and yet it's the only way we know seemingly uh, how to drive our system. Uh, and um, uh, China uh, moves from being a, a system uh, that has been focused on production and excess saving to a system that is focused more on consumption and redeploying that saving, absorbing that saving uh, to fund its safety net, uh, the, um, uh, the health care, the retirement uh, of its citizenry that it, it, it certainly needs uh, a safety net today uh, more than ever. And that has repercussions for us in this construct of uh, a codependency. If one party changes its behavior uh, and the other doesn't, the one who doesn't gets left behind. It's sort of, sort of the scorned partner in the codependent relationship. Think about that. I mean, China for years has been generating a lot of surplus saving, and they send that saving our way. Uh, they buy treasuries. They help us fund uh, our budget deficits. In a rebalanced Chinese society, they don't send us their saving. They, they turn their saving back to their people to support um, the needs of their social safety net, which means they have less saving to invest uh, in the U.S., less demand for our treasuries. And, you know, back to the government shutdown, you know, we still have deficit problems for as far as the eye can see. They're a little bit better today than they have been in recent years, but that's temporary, not permanent. Who's going to fund us over the long haul if our largest foreign lender is now using their surplus to fund themselves rather than, than, than us? 
So, um, and I'll, I'll get to the, the more positive, uplifting thing. Don't worry. I'm not going to leave you hanging there. But I just want to uh, uh, get there by finally just uh, underscoring uh, sort of two alternative ways uh, to frame this very important relationship uh, that um, uh, I commented on at the outset, which has um, uh, clearly been described by a number of, of, um, of, of superlatives. Uh, my uh, hope is that we can now, as, as we deepen our understanding of the relationship, move from uh, a framework of codependency to a framework of interdependency. And let me just stress the difference between um, these two types of, of economic relationships. And they also, I think, uh, have their corollary in personal relationships as well, but that's not my job today. I'm not here as a, um, as a, as a, a psychological counselor. Uh, although I'll pass out my wife's business card after this. <laughs> that is her business. So um, um, in any case, the, 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 the code, uh, codependent relationship um, is inherently an unhealthy relationship uh, where you rely on your partner to serve your needs. In contrast, the interdependent relationship, I would stress, is a, um, a much healthier relationship uh, where the partner is better able to satisfy uh, its own needs uh, as, as, as an economy. Uh, in a codependent relationship, you ultimately lose your sense of self, your, uh, your, your self-identity. Uh, and in the interdependent relationship, you're much more comfortable with who you are uh, in your sense of self, your mission uh, as um, an economy. In a codependent relationship, you tend to blame the other partner for your problems. You get steeped in the blame game. Example being, you know, we blame China uh, for um, currency manipulation and its impact on American middle class workers. We're now doing, you know, the cyber uh, crime issue in the last uh, 24 hours. Uh, in the interdependent relationship, you're, you're more comfortable with who you are, so you're more willing to accept uh, your own sense of responsibility for the issues that you need uh, to uh, address. The codependent relationship is one that um, uh, ultimately does lead to frictions, uh, and if frictions are not dealt with, i.e. the imbalances, uh, the relationship can easily founder and uh, break up. Uh, and uh, the interdependent relationship uh, is a, a, a has the potential for being much more sustainable. In, and finally, in the codependent relationship, there tends to be much greater emphasis on risk than on opportunity. And that's the note I really want to leave you on and, and turn this back to you for, for questions. Rather than view China as a threat, but at the same time facing up to some of the, uh, the tough things that need to be negotiated with China, and there are plenty of those, we can talk about that uh, if you wish, I think we need to view the rebalancing and the coming transformation of China, the next China, as an opportunity. And I, I describe this a lot uh, in several chapters in the book. As China morphs from being the producer to the consumer, it's going to create uh, the most incredible middle class consumption story that the modern world has ever seen uh, in a relatively short period of time. What about us? We are uh, still um, uh, in an anemic post-crisis growth trajectory uh, and our major source of, of economic growth is not growing, and that's you, the American consumer. So we need a new source of growth. And what we need, we need to do exactly what, uh, the opposite of what the Chinese need to do. China needs to save less and consume more. We need to consume less and save more. We need to take our saving, invest it in our people uh, and in our infrastructure, uh, in research, development, innovation, uh, and capacity. Uh, and focus much more on taking advantage of external sources of growth rather than trying to prop up unsustainable internal sources of growth. There's no greater external source of opportunity for economic growth, which will translate into jobs and income for America's uh, beleaguered middle class, than the coming rebalancing of China. I estimate in the book that the, the, um, uh, just the services sector in China, which is increasingly accessible to us, tradable in economic terms uh, as um, the world's 
most competitive services economy, the services economy is going to grow 12 trillion U.S. dollars between now and 2025. Uh, and 35 to 50 percent of that will be available to service uh, companies around the world. Shame on us if we don't take uh, uh, advantage of those opportunities in services like wholesale trade, retail trade, transportation, supply chain logistics, um, and the big one, of course, is healthcare. Uh, China has an embryonic healthcare sector, and they have huge needs given the aging of the Chinese society. So I uh, would prefer that the relationship move away from codependency toward interdependency, uh, away from a fixation on risks and blame uh, to uh, a relationship that focuses on opportunities uh, and acceptance uh, and facing up to our own uh, competitive challenges, which we have sorely neglected. So that's pretty much my message to you this morning. I'd be delighted to um, entertain comments, questions. Uh, we've got a hand up right in the front row. Yes, sir. Look, if, if, if we lose our largest source of, um, the question was, for those of you who didn't hear in the back, if, if we stayed, stay on our path and, and China um, uh, backs down on purchasing treasuries and we continue to sop up the dem demand or somebody else does, uh, what are the implications? The implications are that the terms of our uh, ability to finance our saving short deficit prone economy will change. The dollar will go down, interest rates will rise, uh, and inflation will go up all, and or, or all three of the above. Uh, we've gotten away uh, with being able to fund ourselves with literally um, uh, no significant consequences, in large part because the world itself has been in a low inflation, uh, centrally ban uh, central bank engineered low interest rate climate. If you believe those trends are sustainable, then we can do it indefinitely. I don't believe that. So I think there will be consequences. It's just a question of when, not if. And there was a, a set follow up question to this is can you put a time frame on when that happens? <laughs> a good forecaster will give you an outcome or a date, but not both. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, uh, great question. And um, again, I, I'm, I was going to say I'm not here to sell books, but actually I am. So, uh, <laughs> so chapter eight in the book uh, is a chapter called The China Gripe. And I, I try to address what I think are a lot of the well-known uh, risks that um, uh, many debate you know, in the markets and in political uh, and academic circles right now. Risks such as um, you know, the banking sector, shadow banking sector, the property bubble, uh, the, the cyber hacking issue. Actually, I, I wrote extensively about that long before uh, it broke into the news in the last, say, uh, 36 hours. Um, uh, income inequality, environmental degradation, pollution. But if I had to really pick the biggest risk uh, it would be a point that I briefly alluded to uh, when I was commenting at the outset, and that is uh, that the new government, despite all this sort of glorious strategic um, uh, framework that they have laid out, is unable to dislodge the deeply entrenched power blocks in the party uh, and in the state-owned enterprises who uh, are um, – intertwined through a web of corruption with local Communist Party officials. So this pushback from deeply entrenched power blocks uh, utilizing this web of corruption is the biggest risk. And, the good, and, and that's, that, that is going to be very tough uh, to dislodge because uh, the power blocks have become more and more entrenched the more successful the current system has become over the past close to now 35 years. The new leadership headed up by President Xi Jinping 
uh, knows this. They get it. They've been talking openly about it. And I, I can assure you, you know, people um, uh, tend to think of China as you know, not having open and transparent discussions about its risks. Um, that is not the case. I, I, have, I have heard a lot of this firsthand, and, and you can uh, actually find a lot of their comments on your favorite uh, website. He has been addressing uh, this, this pushback from the power bloc and the corruption issue very vocally, very vigorously now for about 15 months. Uh, and they, they, have, they have arrested um, uh, or have under investigation now close to 30 um, very senior officials, party, state-owned enterprise, local government officials uh, in the last oh, 16 months, uh, which is a rate of um, uh, um, going after this problem that, that, ch that modern China has never before witnessed. But the real problem is more at the grassroots level, and that's tougher. Uh, that is going to be much more difficult uh, to unravel. They, they can't just do corruption and power blocks at the top. They have to do it at the bottom. And if there's one thing that concerns me the most is that despite the plan, despite the strategy, despite the new system of governance that's being rolled out, is that they're stymied by these power blocks on the implementation front. And that's something uh, that we have to watch very carefully. Okay, wow. Well, uh, yes, in the back. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let me just point out that there have been other reserve currencies in, in the history of the world. Uh, the pound sterling was a reserve currency during um, uh, the, the 19th and early 20th century, and actually global trade in the early part of the 20th century prior to World War II uh, surged um, uh, to, to a level as a share of GDP comparable to where we are right now. But, you know, if we lose that role uh, as a reserve currency, we will lose um, uh, the what um, a former French president, uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, said uh, was the um, 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 I'm losing the word, but the exorbitant privilege uh, of the reserve currency, where we could actually uh, uh, fund our excesses uh, in our own uh, currency rather than in the currency of, uh, of others. I, I don't think we're going to lose that role uh, of, of the reserve currency in, in the world at any point in the near term. I think over time, though, as other uh, countries emerge on the scene and become more powerful, uh, I, I could certainly envision uh, a world that has um, uh, uh, other uh, reserve currencies. And it may be a multipolar world where the, the dollar is a reserve currency uh, with, say, the Chinese renminbi. And a, a currency that you know you may think is totally outrageous to take that role. It could be the uh, uh, the euro if they ever get their act together. Um, will this work to our disadvantage? Only if we fail to get our economic house uh, in order. We can do global trade in a multi-reserve currency um, uh, system, uh, but uh, we can't enjoy the fruits of global trade if we continue to mismanage our economies. Uh, global trade. Uh, prior to the crisis, uh, hit an all-time high, uh, slightly above the levels that were uh, prevalent in the early part of the 20th century uh, as a share of, of world GDP. And we and others uh, reaped the benefits of that. And global trade since the crisis has flattened out, reflective of our own problems in managing our economy in this post-crisis era. Those are the problems that we need to address. Uh, and the currency, I think, will take care of itself over time. Yes.
You know, the question is, um, you know, what happens if China itself is a big bubble and um, uh, how um, uh, sustainable uh, will the system be to move to consumption if the bubble bursts? I'm not a believer in the China bubble theory. Uh, there, there are a number of people uh, who are, uh, and I debate them around the world um, uh, on this topic a lot. They focus in particular on the so-called housing bubble, and they'll tell you there are a lot of ghost cities in China. Uh, I don't buy it. Uh, the first ghost city I saw in China was uh, Shanghai Pudong uh, in 1995. It was the world's largest construction site. There are now five and a half million people living there. The place <coughs> is fully occupied. China moves between 15 and 20 million people a year from the countryside to the city. You have to build in anticipation of that rather than invite them into the cities and have them live in squalor until you provide housing for that. So when you pick up the Wall Street Journal, as you could have maybe six weeks ago, and you know there's a big color photo on the front page of an empty housing block, um, ask the Wall Street Journal uh, five years from now to go back and, and take the same photograph, and you'll be surprised at how many people are living there. Um, sure, there are some misallocations of capital, and there's one city in Inner Mongolia, Ordos, that is a huge city that will probably never be occupied. And But those are the exceptions not the rule. China needs to build between 70 and 90 new cities with average population and a minimum of 1 million people between now and 2030 to satisfy the urban influx that is going to be coming from the countryside. So there will be periodic mismatches between supply and demand during that transitions process, but this is not a bubble. What people miss in making the case on the bubble um, is th that uh, even though the population is fixed, the urban population is growing about 3% a year and will continue to do so between now and 2030. That creates a demand uh, for what is characterized incorrectly, in my view, for China's excess supply. So bubble, no. Yes. Well, you know, I think, um, oh yeah, sorry, Par I apologize, uh, I will repeat that. China moving from um, manufacturing to services, um, uh, it was an exporter of, um, uh, of deflation in um, manufacturing and now you're fearful it will be an exporter of deflation in services, is that? Oh, inflation, okay. Um, anyway, uh, there's a fear that the China uh, price factor will move from being a source of deflation uh, to a source of inflation as it moves from goods to services. Um, you know, that's, that, that's a good point. Uh, but I, I think the, the answer will be uh, uh, whether or not the world itself is able to, better able to achieve a balance between aggregate supply and aggregate demand. It's important to look at uh, prices in this era of globalization uh, in, a, in a global context. And that's true of what we used to even call uh, untradeable services. We used to never think that services could be traded around the world, but now a large portion of them, uh, of, of them can. And so as, as China uh, moves into more of a service-based economy, and by the way, for those of you looking for evidence that China uh, is making progress on the road to rebalancing, Look at the, d the data. The services sector has now emerged as the largest sector in China in just the last year. It's a pretty stunning uh, development. So it's happening uh, right now. Um, I don't think that this means that, um, uh, that, that China, though, will shift to a major source of inflation uh, for um, a, a long point in, in, in time. I think there's still a lot of excess capacity uh, in terms of uh, uh, the potential for services industries uh, to produce more with less through um, uh, judicious use of information technology, automation, and scaling out uh, their platforms in markets around the world. Uh, we have the largest service, services economy in the world uh, in the United States, 
uh, and yet we have increasing gr global sc scope to connect our multinational service providers with offshore markets such as those in China. India has the same uh, with its uh, 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 outsourcing call centers uh, and uh, other types of <coughs> business process um, organization um, uh, companies do the, do the same for services-based solutions around the world. So I think technology and globalization uh, will allow services to spread globally uh, without really creating a sense of, um, uh, of more rapid inflation. In terms of goods, uh, there are plenty of other markets out there with still very low cost production platforms in Asia uh, and uh, in South America and in Eastern Europe that I think will put a limit uh, on uh, uh, global price increases uh, for the foreseeable future. Tom. Okay, the, the question is um, um, don't, well, the, the editorial comment is, you know, don't write us off yet. We're still resilient. Um, and we're now, there are many people who are talking about the manufacturing renaissance led by breakthroughs in uh, uh, new uh, energy extraction technologies. Can we frack our way back to prosperity <laughs> uh, is, is the question. Uh, and there are a lot of people who say that, you know, that is an example uh, of a system that is perfectly capable of reinventing itself. And, uh, you know, we are an innovative and resilient uh, system. But I think the, the, the ultimate test as to whether or not the renaissance will get us out of the mess that we still seem to be in is whether or not uh, we, we can really create uh, jobs. And, um, you know, I think that there are some uh, and, and, and many people have actually, not many, a few people, some of whom are uh, actually, uh, there's one in particular who used to live in New Canaan but now has departed for Row Um <laughs> who has written about some of the environmental downside issues associated with uh, fracking. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I, I think there, there are a lot of questions that, that need to be addressed with respect to how that technology, whether or not that technology is, is sustainable is the renaissance story would lead you to believe. But the manufacturing renaissance issue itself, uh, even though it can be um, uh, uh, certainly um, boosted by cheaper energy, uh, is now a very small piece of our overall employment in the United States. It's down to about 10% of total employment. Uh, and manufacturing activity uh, in the U.S. and increasingly in uh, wealthy countries around the world uses more capital, more machines than people uh, to derive um, uh, economic growth. Can we really convert the manufacturing renaissance into the solution for the American middle class in terms of jobs uh, and real income? Go back to, you know, a famous um, dinner that was held um, in the White House the, the summer before uh, Steve Jobs uh, uh, died. Uh, when um, I actually was held in Silicon Valley with President Obama gathering some Silicon Valley executives to talk about innovation and job creation. And he pointedly asked Steve Jobs, um, uh, what would it take for Apple to bring uh, all those jobs back to America? Apple, by way of reference, employs about 750,000 workers around the world. 10% uh, of them are in the United States. Uh, they innovate arguably our most innovative uh, uh, company in many respects, but they create jobs offshore, primarily in China, and Jobs said those jobs are not uh, coming back because the alternatives in terms of what uh, countries like China or other countries around the world can provide in terms of low labor costs, infrastructure, uh, and the lack of regulatory constraints are far superior 
to what we offer in the United States. Those are the issues that we need to address to convert the manufacturing renaissance uh, into a solution uh, to our problem. And that doesn't mean we can't do it, but I, I think it's going to take more than just the discovery of a new uh, uh, extraction technology of energy to, to achieve that. that uh, but I, I don't want to minimize the significance of that development. Okay, wow. Um, in the back, pink shirt. Can you discuss the uh, potential power of the Atlantic Gas Pipeline? I heard that there was a possibility. Uh, demographic story, they've got um, a high-speed aging problem. Everything in China, you know, goes at, you know, double, triple the pace. I mean, they, because of the one-child family planning policy, which, by the way, they're now modifying. That was another thing that came out of the third plenum. They, they, they're under a lot of pressure to change it um, because of the distortions it's caused, and, and they recognize that. So they are uh, now moving into a period where they're, they're going to unwind that. But the damage has been done, so their working age population is now shrinking. Their overall population will begin declining um, by the, um, uh, the year, you know, somewhere in the 2025, 2030 time frame. Uh, a couple of implications. They desperately need to fund their retirement system, uh, and um, they, they don't have nearly enough assets to take care of the retirement uh, benefits for the um, uh, the aging society, uh, and uh, again, coming out of this meeting last November, the third plenum, uh, one of the key measures they, they ratified uh, was to raise the taxes on their state-owned enterprises uh, from 15 to 30 percent to provide a funding mechanism for their nationwide Social Security system. They also need health care, uh, and um, uh, uh, that, that system uh, is also woefully underfunded woefully uh, un underbuilt, uh, and uh, they need uh, to uh, institutionally establish a more um, uh, a fully functioning secondary labor market system to allow workers, they're pretty good at placing workers out of college, but in terms of um, mid-career uh, work placement um, uh, efforts, uh, the labor market function it really does not exist, and they need to uh, work on that. Uh, to provide the type of uh, employment growth that an aging society uh, will increasingly uh, require. Yes. Uh, as, as you were probably, uh, Japan's had a very rapid growth rate up until the late end of the 90s, and then it just kind of fizzled off. Um, kind of. Great question. Whatever happened to um, Japan, could it happen to China? Um, one of the courses, another course I teach at Yale is called The Lessons of Japan, and we ask that question. Uh, and so I would urge you to enroll in my class. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, Japan screwed up big time, and their mistakes were, were, were basically policy mistakes, human mistakes that were made in mismanaging their economy. They also built a system uh, that was predicated on financial churning, you know, banks recycling current account uh, surpluses uh, into uneconomic lending. There are some similarities uh, with China. They also um, uh, deliberately suppressed the value of their, their currency, the yen, uh, to drive this export growth model to, to excess. Uh, and in the mid-1980s, they caved into pressure from us and the Europeans to take the yen way back up uh, to, to make life easier for us. Uh, and then they, they countered that uh, by um, uh, ridiculously uh, stimulative monetary policy, which created bubbles, which brought the whole house of cards down in the 90s. They've had two and a half lost decades and counting since then. China has studied this um, phenomenon very carefully. Number one, they're not uh, uh, following Japan from the currency point of view, they've allowed their currency, the renminbi, contrary to what you hear from Washington, to rise 37 percent over the last eight years. It's, it's sold off by three percentage points of that uh, this year, but it's up 34 percent from mid-2005. Um, and they're much more focused on um, uh, matters of financial stability and in, in trying to 
uh, alter the growth model. And Japan tried to hold on to the old, old growth model for too long. Uh, I don't buy the view that that uh, that China is uh, headed for Japanese-like lost decades, but there are many who do. There was a columnist uh, last week in the Financial Times who I have a lot of respect for, uh, Jillian Tett, uh, who wrote a, a, an op-ed that um, said that um, that's exactly where China's headed. Uh, she knows a lot about um, Japan, but I, I think she's missed the point on, on China. Okay, yes, right here. Yeah. Uh, you've seen a lot of discussion in the last few years about China. You're next. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. You, you're, you're talking. Resource needs in a rebalanced China. China is not going to walk away from the fuel and resource supplies that it needs for its current state of, econo uh, of, of its economy. But in looking at prospective growth, more of it in the future will come from resource light services than from resource intensive manufacturing and construction. One asterisk or caveat to that is to build the uh, 70 to 90 new cities, that'll take a lot of, of resources. But for the resource supply chain that has benefited so handsomely uh, from uh, the China of the last 35 years, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Canada, uh, and the like, uh, the next phase of China will be less constructive for them in providing the demand from their major external source of demand than it has, and, and those economies uh, have hooked their wagon to a China that would perpetuate the old model rather than change to a new model. So it'll be challenging. Yes? Quantitative easing, um, U.S., Japan, not quite Europe yet, but there's uh, a possibility of that. And, you know, hasn't China done the same thing? First of all, I hate quantitative easing. Um, you know, it helped us in the depths of the crisis, but it's done nothing except create the next future source of instability uh, for um, the recovery that we're, right in, we're in right now. Um, if you want to see the contrast between the quantitative easing um, uh, and, um, you know, a different approach to, to, to fostering a more sustainable uh, recovery. Read, there was an article in the New York Times this past Sunday that contrasted recent work of a new book uh, that focuses on the consumer debt as the source of the problem rather than on the impaired financial system as the source of problem. It's on the front page of the um, uh, the New York Times business section. China has rapid money supply growth, not because it's engaged in quantitative easing, but in large part because it has a closed uh, capital account and it gets a, uh, uh, a lot of speculative inflows into its markets to bet on future um, appreciation of, of the renminbi. And as China moves hopefully to a, a more of a two-way uh, currency trading market, those speculative inflows will diminish uh, and its money supply will be brought under greater control. China also has a bank-centric system of credit intermediation, uh, surprisingly and disturbingly limited development of its uh, internal capital markets as it do does that. The, the role of the banks in driving the money supply and economic activity uh, will also diminish. So the hope is that, uh, that China will be able uh, to um, uh, avoid an imbalanced uh, financial system that will lead to um, tighter control over its domestic money supply. Uh, we're seeing that a little bit at the margin right now, but there's a, a lot more that needs to be done. Okay, we have time for a few more. Um, yes.
<laughs> okay. Um, question is, uh, China China becomes more like the U.S. Um, who's the next miracle? Um, you know, uh, I have no idea. I mean, you 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 know, to from the standpoint of of the way I look at the world, uh, there is a, a distinct possibility, and I say this with a little bit of um, uh, sort of. Um, caution grounded in, in history of making claims like this. Um, but I, I think China could be the next miracle because I think they're going to come up with a more sustainable uh, recipe for economic growth, morphing from the producer to the consumer uh, and taking a consumption share of its GDP, which is currently 36 percent of its GDP uh, versus our roughly 70 percent, taking that up into the you know, 55 to 60 percent range over the next 10 to 15 years. I think that'll be uh, miraculous and as the world hopefully stays more open, a real opportunity uh, for us. But I'm cautious in saying that because uh, you know, a former colleague of mine at Morgan Stanley, when asked in 1995 after a huge um, burst of economic activity from Mexico, he was asked uh, who, was the, who would the next Mexico be? And he said Mexico and that was two months before Mexico went into a peso crisis and disappeared <laughs> off the scene. So I'm a little cautious <laughs> in saying that the next miracle of, um, uh, of, of, of the world will be China. A lot of people are focused on India right now uh, post um, uh, the recent um, uh, election, but um, you know, we'll see if that plays out. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a, probably a great question to end on, uh, and then I'll be delighted to stick around and, and talk to you afterwards. The question is difference in political systems, uh, the democracy versus the one-party authoritarian state. Um, where is that headed? What's it mean um, uh, looking back and then, most importantly, looking forward? Looking back, um, you know, I think the authoritarian one-party state had its real advantages because the focus was on production and distribution. Uh, you know, and you know, you know, what do you need, you know, a political debate about how to do it? You just need, you know, a plan, a focus, an implementation, and get the job done. And they got the job done. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I do talk a lot in the book about uh, the two leaders of the economy, uh, Premier Zhu Rongji and his uh, successor, uh, Premier Wen Jiabao, who got the job done, but they got the job done in a way that was unattentive to the imbalances that built, and so now uh, the next team really has to deal uh, with the, 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 the imbalances. But the challenge for China is to go from the production model to the consumer model. Think about a consumer model. You know, it's, it's definitely one that ultimately is predicated on, a, on an aspirational value proposition. It requires free and open communication, upward mobility, uh, a sharing of um, uh, of uh, emotions, concerns uh, about the future. Uh, and this one-party authoritarian state will have to come to grips uh, with the aspirational value proposition of a consumer society. They don't know much about it. Uh, and to the extent that they um, will repress some of that, and there's evidence that they certainly do repress um, uh, free and open expression in, in several areas, but not in all areas, I would, I would urge uh, to, to you to be balanced in that respect, that could be a problem down the road. Are they headed to the ultimate in democracy, the, the, the democratic institutions as we know it, uh, 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 freely elected representatives? Uh, I, I'd say that that is the end game, but it's one that, you know, maybe this young man here will see in his lifetime, but uh, most of us will probably not see. China does now have freely elected uh, um, uh, um, representatives for its local village governments, small drop 
uh, in, in a big ocean. I'd say over the next 10 years, I could envision a structure where there is um, uh, uh, intra-party uh, 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 competition for elections at the national level, s s a slate of, um, of candidates running for one seat in the National People's um, Congress under the auspices of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but in terms of cross-party, uh, multi-party competition, um, I, I really have a hard time envisioning that at any point in the foreseeable future because that will raise uh, the whole issue of um, uh, the sustainability of, of the Communist Party uh, and its authority in, in governing the system. Uh, will it ultimately happen? Um, history tells us, you know, it will. Uh, but, you know, I think history is an imperfect guide uh, in especially in, in trying to understand uh, the way the Chinese system operates. And uh, that'll, that'll, that'll be China's probably biggest challenge to face uh, at some point down the road, and that is the alignment of its political system uh, with the, the aspirational value proposition uh, of that, is, that must ultimately be embedded in the People's Republic of China. So why don't I... <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming this morning. It was a great program and Stephen is going to stick around to sign books if you purchased a book this morning and he's here to have informal conversation as well. Thank you very much for coming.